Yes, I am here to talk to you today. Uh, I had instructions to talk a little tiny bit about uh, our business model since it's unusual. Uh, but also, I'm going to be talking about how to hack stuff with chatbots. And when I say hack stuff, that's wh exactly what I mean. Uh, I am a ethical hacker, a computer hacker, and I have a security company called Radically Open Security. So, uh, but first I'm going to talk a little bit about Radically Open Security. We are a not-for-profit computer security consultancy company. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so what that means is uh, we are something called a uh, fiscal fundraising institution. In Dutch, it's called a fiscal fundsverfende instelling for the NLNet Foundation. Okay. Now, this is actually a business model that came from the Dutch churches. Churches sometimes want to be able to do some kind of commercial activity, and then they want to get the money back to the church again. Okay. So basically, an example of this is the uh, Language Institute Regina Chaley, otherwise known uh, as the Nonnen van Feucht, uh, so the nuns of this little village called Feucht. Uh, the nuns started this uh, language institute. It's an independently operating uh, language institute of quite good quality, I might add. <laughs> and uh, then when profits are made, they go basically at least 90% back to the nuns. So we basically stole this, uh, well, this uh, construction, and we decided that we were going to make our church an LNET. <laughs> Um, those of you who are not familiar with NLNet, uh, it is a, uh, a foundation, an Anbistichting, that has for at least 20 years given money away to open source, to academic research, to basically uh, digital rights projects, and basically anything for a better internet. Why did I set up a nonprofit security consultancy company? Quite frankly, it's because I was a bit horrified at how commercial the security consultancy industry had become. I had a period of time where I used to work in the CSERT team for ING Bank. I dealt with a number of these uh, consultancy companies. They came in, they acted like black boxes. They were like, security is hard. Stand back. <laughs> we are going to solve everything for you and give you a report and a huge bill. So, <laughs> and I was just like, you know, if you guys are so lead, then, you know, there's a ton I can learn from you. So, uh, you know, do you mind, you know, if I watch along with what you're doing? And they were like, no, but really security is hard. And I was like, okay, you know, I used to be an assistant professor of computer science at the Freie Universität, specialized in computer security. <laughs> Try me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but they threw away bash history logging. They worked in screen and forgot to turn on logging, even though I reminded them to do it 10 times. Eventually, I just physically stood there and watched over their shoulders because th that way they couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> you know, and I saw, that, of course, of course, that they were using the same open source tools as everyone else. Surprise. So, uh, you know, I, I basically was a bit disgruntled by this. I asked around, hey, you know, other companies, governments, organizations, whoever, are you happy with this be black box behavior? And everybody was like universally like, well, no, but what's the alternative? Okay. And at the same time, the hacker community was also extremely unhappy with the, you know, with the choice of employers. <laughs> uh, you know, either you work for big accountancy firms or for people working with the secret intelligence agencies. So, you know, take your pick. So uh, uh, basically I figured, you know what, I think there's a hole in the market. So four years ago I left to found uh, Radically Open Security. So we are in many ways, extremely strange <laughs> as a company. Uh, not just because uh, we're nonprofit, but also because we are Gosh, extremely modern. We're completely online. We have no office. Yeah. I mean, of course, on some days when I see like the pretty view out of the booking office, maybe uh, then I wonder what I might be missing. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but uh, the truth is uh, we have a globally distributed staff. So I've got like three pen testers in Australia. I've got, you know, a few more in India. I've got some in Latin America. I've got them spread throughout Europe. You know, so then an office doesn't really make sense. You know, so we work online in chat rooms, okay? So how many people here use Slack or something like it? Okay, that's almost everybody. So uh, we don't use Slack uh, just because it's a cloud service and we, pen and we hack people's stuff. So, you know, and it's as the t-shirt says, you know, there is no cloud, there's just other people's computers. <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, instead, we use this thing called Rocket Chat. Who here has ever heard of Rocket Chat? Okay, fewer hands. So Rocket Chat is an open source, self-hosted Slack clone. Okay. Uh, Mattermost is also very similar. Who here uses Mattermost? Anybody? No. Okay. The nice thing about Mattermost is that it's bundled with GitLab. But uh, but we we use Rocket Chat, and it's great. I mean, it's basically just like Slack, except we have governance over our own data. <laughs> you know, on top of that, it's also uh, free as in freedom. It's also free as in beer, which, you know, who doesn't love that? So, uh, <laughs> you know, it also has all the different uh, Slack integrations, uh, which uh, are super useful. So uh, just saying, you guys might want to check out Rocket Chat. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, yeah, so we also are a collective of freelancers. Okay. So my entire company is a collective of freelancers and SMEs, okay? So basically my company has one employee, that's me. I would, I would be freelance too, but that's actually not allowed by the, uh, by the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> the director actually has to be internal. So, uh, but everybody else is either freelance or an SME. And we've got 35 people <laughs> that we're collaborating with. So the funny thing is we're actually creating an organization out of movable parts. You know, which also, again, makes us an extremely unusual organization, you know, <laughs> and uh, because everyone is freelance, it means they're also only part time. Uh, so all of them have their own gigs going on. They have their own companies. They have their own indep independent customers, but they do come to us to collaborate, <laughs> you know, when there's stuff that needs to be done. And we basically just set it up as win-win. But of course, it's kind of fun, fuzzy in our head then, you know, what is our organization actually? Because <laughs> if people say to me, oh yeah, this person in your project management team, does he work for Radically Open Security? Well, yes, he does. But then again, also he sort of doesn't. <laughs> you know, but, but sharing is the new owning. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it works that way with companies too. And uh, how do we organize all of this? Uh, we also use this management methodology that is quite excellent that is called Holacracy. Um, I believe that Booking, as far as I know, is also doing uh, trials with this. Uh, we're also working with organization builders. I'm pretty sure that uh, <laughs> I think that you guys are too. So, uh, uh, but as far as I know, <laughs> but in either case, um, we are super happy with it. And the way that that's organized is we have several different circles with different role descriptions. And then people can basically uh, assume as many or as few roles as they want, which allows people to kind of swap in, wear a few different hats, and then swap out. And it's actually a really fun, occasionally it's a headache, I'll be honest. But like, you know, because <laughs> it means you can't really rely on people being there. But then again, it also allows you to build a really resilient organization where people can come and go, and it reduces bus factors. So anyway. But because we have this highly unusual environment for our company and, and this highly unusual structure, it requires that we set things up in a certain way. So that's also partly what my uh, talk is going to be about today. Now coming back to the actual topic of my talk, uh, which is chat ops. So, but what is chat ops? How, who, who here actually knows what chat ops is? Oh my gosh, almost no hands. Okay, so chat ops is basically uh, making use of chatbots to turn your chat room into a command line, okay? And then using that chat room as the command and control center of your operations. So chat ops is a concept that we gratuitously stole from the company GitHub. We all love GitHub. The, night, the interesting thing about GitHub is they also are highly distributed and online. So I believe they have an office in the Bay Area, but they also have staff members all over the world, okay? So the chat room at that point becomes your office. So GitHub created this open source chatbot called Hubot, okay? And uh, Hubot, again, it's open source, so anybody can uh, install this and play around with it. But what they did is 
GitHub used the chatbot as sort of the, the command and control center for their DevOps. So, you know, I saw the light about three years ago, I think at the DevOps days <laughs> here in Amsterdam at Pakas, uh, the Zweiger. And there was a guy from GitHub who was giving a talk and he was basically saying, look, this is how we can deploy a new server. You know, Hubot, you know, I don't know exactly what it was, but you know, deploy server. And then, you know, the server was deployed. And then he said, uh, now I'd like to see some statistics about our uptime. So then Hubot, you know, shows statistics on, you know, whatever it was statistics. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And then people were able to intersperse conversations in between, you know, performing the actual operational, um, uh, uh, how do I say, operational operations. <laughs> so, and, and this was actually really great because if you have a distributed team, this makes the work that they're doing visible to everyone and allows you really to coordinate and to discuss. So I saw this and I said, oh my gosh, this would be incredible for penetration testing. So, uh, so penetration testing, for those of you who do not know what that means, it means hacking stuff. So Radically Open Security is a company of ethical hackers. So we break things. We break people's software. We break people's networks. We break people's infra. We break people's, uh, you know, embedded systems. We break people's crypto. You name it, we break it. <laughs> it's a fun job. <laughs> And it's easier to break it than to build it right, by the way. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so <laughs> uh, so basically I figured, you know, I think we could really use this chatbot in our penetration testing process. So we ran home and we uh, set up Rocket Chat and, uh, and our own version of Hubot. And uh, we basically said, you know, what kinds of commands could we possibly perform, you know, with, uh, with a chatbot? Um, by the way, my, my Nita slide is a bit old and it needs to be replaced, <laughs> but uh, actually is ancient. But, uh, but in either case, uh, j but it gives an idea, though, of what uh, you can do. It's really a combination of stuff that's useful and stuff that's completely useless. So, for example, uh, you can have a, I mean, as you were able to could see in the last slide, uh, there's this a command here called rawspot pug me. So I type in rawspot pug me and then you get a picture of a pug. It's completely useless. <laughs> it's, it's good for culture, though. But uh, you know, <laughs> but there's also other actually useful things that we can do with it, though. I mean, for example, uh, we can use go, you know, raw spot MD5 and be able to calculate a hash for something. We can also go raw spot nmap, you know, <laughs> one twenty seven zero zero one, you know, and perform an nmap scan on our internal network. You know, we we've actually got a number of our hacking tools actually set up so that we can invoke them via the chat. We've also got exactly the same thing with our uh, re report and documentation structure, and ultimately with our almost our entire workflow. So, uh, like every company in the universe, our techies hate documentation. <laughs> you know. But, you know, if you're pen testers, it's a necessary evil. You know, customers want their pen test reports. It's just, you know, facts, inconvenient facts of life. So uh, like every other pen test company in the universe, we created our automated system to try and take some of the pain out of this. So uh, we have XML templates. And uh, basically what you can do is you can fill in about an A4's worth of uh, XML, and then you can basically compile it, and then uh, you can get uh, quotations, uh, for example. You can also do the same with penetration test reports. Um, well, this is the expanded form, but uh, if you compile it, you get something that looks kind of like this, which basically looks like every pen testing report in the universe. <laughs> so uh, we created a system called pen text for this, pen text. So we open source this. So if any of you, any of you want to do internal scanning and want to produce your own pretty reports, it's open source, so feel free to steal it. In fact, we even made an OWASP project out of it. How many of you here are familiar with OWASP? OK. Ever heard of the OWASP top 10? <laughs> if not, please research it. <laughs> this is important. <laughs> Secure coding. But uh, anyhow, so. Uh, yeah, so we have, uh, you know, an OWASP is basically the umbrella organization for web penetration testers, aka the kinds of people who are hacking the stuff that you guys are writing. So you should know about OWASP, uh, the OWASP top 10. There's a bunch of open source tools available there that you can use. 
So anyhow, but uh, the nice thing is we can actually invoke all of this stuff then via uh, the chat. So you can see an example here that we, I can go, for example, Rossbot, quick scope, and in this case, it's for a quotation. So uh, OFF is for Oferta. I'm sorry, we're a Dutch company. <laughs> um, you know, but uh, so Oferta, Melanie, demo. Uh, and then what happens is Rawspot at that point converts that uh, A4 is worth of XML into a larger, uh, more expansive XML. Then I go Rawspot build quote uh, Oferta Melanie demo. And what you can see is Rawspot at this point is actually invoking now the backend tool chain that we have set up on the server for compiling XML documents into PDFs. At that point, it says, okay, I have now built this PDF. It's also password protected. So here's the password for this PDF that I just built. Click here to open it. Now, what's great about this? What's great about this is I can onboard new staff members into my company and they can basically use our entire XML to PDF tool chain without having to install a single thing on their client device. What you're doing is you're actually taking a web browser <laughs> and basically turning that web browser basically into the, inter into the interface to the actual working environment, the operational environment of your company. So what this means is that our, you know, our environment, our chat ops environment, of course, is you know, maintained by system administrators and DevOps folks on our backend servers. But once that's set up, you know, people can then, once they get through a couple layers of authentication, of course, but, uh, you know, once they then get through that, they can use our, the entire power of our entire hacking environment without having to install anything. So that, that Nmap scan, like with, you know, Rawspot Nmap, you know, I can launch it basically from my laptop in a coffee shop. I can launch it from my cell phone, you know, while sitting on a, on a bus. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is actually the really great thing, <laughs> you know, and, and again, we can basically bring new people in. We don't have to worry about administering uh, their client devices. I mean, there's a few basic OPSEC rules they should follow, like, you know, please work in VMs and, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, at the same time, you know, it really centralizes, you know, all of these, uh, these efforts. And it's also incredibly powerful. <laughs> It also means that uh, if we make updates to the software that we're using for our operations, you know, we don't have to have to actually have to deploy it, you know, <laughs> uh, to everybody. You know, we just make one uh, change on that backend server, and then everybody then at that point uh, has that upgrade. So that's really nice. Um, another really nice thing that we do, by the way, with this chat ops stuff, and so I told you guys that story about how I was standing and watching over the, con you know, the, the security consultant's shoulder, right? Because <laughs> I wanted to know what was going on. So we created this thing called peek over our shoulder. What that means is we invite customers to join us in our chat rooms so they can watch us hacking their stuff in real time, you know, during the course of an engagement. So basically when hackers, ethical hackers are having conversations, talking about hacking their stuff, they can eavesdrop and listen to those conversations, every word of them, because our chat room is our office. So because our chat room is our primary means of communications, it means that the customer who then can be added into the chat room hears everything that we've said. So that actually, you know, basically takes that black box and completely explodes it inside out into something that is so transparent, you know, it's almost annoying. <laughs> actually, it's not. But, uh, <laughs> but the other thing that we do is we make use of this chatbot. So Rawspot, uh, which is what it's called, of course, because we're radically open security. It also is hooked up to our GitLab repository. So we also make use of GitLab, another good Amsterdam company. And uh, <laughs> we uh, use... Basically, that for, of course, uh, you know, well, what do you use Git for? Of course, uh, you know, uh, document management and also uh, merging and collaboration and all of that kind of good stuff. So during penetration tests, we use GitLab issues uh, for writing up uh, notes uh, and comments and, you know, findings and that kind of thing. And then we have, uh, for example, if you want to push some scan results, we can just, you know, do a push to that GitLab repo. 
Now we use the Slack integrations between GitLab and uh, Rocket Chat. So uh, at that point, the, the chatbot makes step-by-step -step announcements that, you know, this pen tester just made this comment at this timestamp. Click here for more information. <laughs> okay, so literally the customer who is just sitting there in the channel is getting updates, you know, several times an hour that the pen tester just did this, the pen tester just did that, the pen tester just did that. Do you know how much extra work it takes for the pen tester to do this? Zero. <laughs> so we literally can make our entire process completely transparent to the customer with no extra work. And by the way, with this layer, of, this level of transparency, it leads to happy customers. <laughs> you know, the other nice thing is a lot of people say, yeah, but isn't it really annoying having the customer in your chat room? Well, actually, no, it's not. It's not annoying at all. And for several reasons. One reason is because, uh, you know, if we are performing a penetration test, we are a third party. So we're basically coming in without prior knowledge of their system. Nobody knows the customer's systems and code and infrastructure as well as the customer themselves. So when we have the customer in our chat room, it is like having an oracle in our chat room. <laughs> so if we get stuck, you know, or if we have questions, or if we need a, a server rebooted or whatever, you know, we literally have the developers of that software that we're testing or the sysadmins or whoever else in the channel with us. So we can just ask, you know, hey, what does this code path actually do? What, what is it? How about this function? You know, by the way, you know, did you guys use a strong password here? You know, we're wondering if it's worth the time, you know, to, to, to run the cracker, et cetera. So, you know, and this is really handy. Because it means, you know, instead of just hitting our head up against brick walls and then having to uh, figure it out sort of by ourselves, I mean, we've got, you know, the people who have actually developed it here saying, oh, no worries, you know, you do this and you do that. And it makes us twice as efficient at the end of the day <laughs> in being able to pen test because we don't waste time on stupid things. <laughs> the other nice thing about giving radical transparency to your working processes to your customers is because let's face it occasionally things go wrong right <laughs> you know it could very well be that maybe we accidentally at the beginning of the work uh, at the beginning of the uh, engagement for example underscope the work so we thought oh you know we could perhaps perform this pen test in three weeks, but now, you know, we're at uh, one and a half weeks and, oh, it actually turns out that we might have underestimated how big, you know, or how complex or, you know, the, the second half was. So because the customer is there, we can then say, hey, you know, dear customer, <laughs> you know, we are now at the 50% point uh, of our engagement. We've used N hours. There's, you know, N hours left. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it looks like we might have grossly, you know, <laughs> made an incorrect guess about how long this would take. We would like your input about what is the most important so we can actually make sure that in the time remaining, we can actually prioritize the most important things for you. <laughs> and then we can make sure the slightly less important things then get written up as being future work. Now, this actually makes customers really happy, <laughs> you know, because it makes sure that their priorities get met, you know, and it also prevents those kinds of nasty surprises. And if anything, there's anything the customers don't like, it's, it's nasty surprises, <laughs> you know, but because you have this level of deep communications going on with them all the time and they feel like they have knobs to turn and buttons that they can push, you know, it actually ultimately, if they see something, a problem coming, they see it coming from a mile away, you know, which means that they actually have input then in helping you to fix it. By the way, what I'm saying right now is not just applicable to pen testing. This might also be applicable to software development. <laughs> this could also be applicable to data analysis. <laughs> I mean, basically anyone who's dealing with customers, you know, take a moment to pause and reflect on how actually having your customers in the chat room with, with you might make you have, make your own customers happier. So anyhow, but uh, moving on. So GitLab uh, is another part of sort of the, uh, I don't know, holy trilogy of open source software that we, uh, that we use. Uh, we also make use of uh, the Canboard uh, open source uh, software uh, for our project management. Although I have to say we're migrating over to using GitLab <laughs> for that now, but uh, uh, well, for using their uh, Canboard. But uh, uh, so, you know, the repos look as repos would look. Um, 
you know, but all, all manners of tooling, you know, we can basically hook up via this chat up stuff. So for example, we created an open source passive scanning tool. So this takes uh, output from uh, Shodan, from uh, Census, you know, Scans.io, uh, from basically passive uh, scanning sources that we would perhaps run at the start of a pen test. We've open sourced this, by the way. <laughs> Check out our GitHub repository. It's actually our policy with Radically Open Security to open source all of the tools and frameworks and documentation and trainings and absolutely everything that the company does, except for personal data, because we love the GDPR. So, uh, <laughs> and of course, also uh, customer pen test data, because that's confidential. Uh, but, uh, you know, but everything else that can be sanitized, uh, we do release as open source. But we can then take this passive vulnerability scanning tool and then, again, be able to invoke this via the chat. Cool, right? Something else that we can do is something called red-blue pen testing. So what we do is we take uh, the penetration test of a customer, and we can take, we basically gamify their pen test. Okay? So let's say that we have a dozen developers, sysadmins, DevOps folks. Now let's say we take this dozen and we split them into two teams. It could be a red team and a blue team. It could be a red team and a red team. Depends on how they want to set it up. But uh, we take each team, and each team is guided by one of our professional pen testers. What we then do is we give them a set period of time, let's say a few days, and they compete to hack their own stuff. Okay? So basically, uh, this is actually a really great way to do it because uh, developers know their own product <laughs> inside and out. And they've also got their own ideas about what might be a little bit wonky, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, with that product. And if the developers uh, get stuck, uh, of course, our professional pen testers are there to be like, hey, if you thought about that, you ever used this tool, why don't you try this? You know, just to, to you know, provide enough hints to keep things going. The really nice thing about this is basically for the price of two full-time pen testers, you know, for a few days, <laughs> you know, probably plus a, a couple extra days to clean up the mess that you guys make out of the reporting. But uh, <laughs> that, that aside, um, you know, basically what you get is actually a training exercise for a dozen people <laughs> and, and an incredibly thorough pen test report because you basically just had a dozen minds and a dozen eyeballs looking at that code. But the best thing about this is that it eliminates the, the defensiveness of the developers you know, for the, against the pen testing process. Because if you come in as a third party and you say, your stuff is broken, then you know what people are going to say? They're going to say, no, it's not. But it, it's supposed to be that way. It's a feature. <laughs> yeah, but this manager signed off on it, so it's OK. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, but you have to be super geniuses you know, to, to be able to do this stuff. And, you know. But the thing is, the second that they hack it themselves, they're like, <laughs> They're like, yeah, man, <laughs> I did this, you know, and they are proud that they hacked their own stuff, <laughs> you know, and because it's actually turned into a competition and they're competing against one another, they get into it, you know, so they completely step out of the role of being a developer for a few days and then they step into the, into the shoes of being a hacker. And then that is completely where, what, what they throw themselves into. And the number one comment that we get at the end of these red blue exercises is, and I quote, I will never think about code the same way again. And that is what it's all about. <laughs> you know, because coming in also as a pen test company and giving a pen test and just having people fix it, you know, it, it's like, you know, it's like the old parable with like, you know, teaching to fish versus throwing fish. You can throw fish, but at the end of the day, security is not a pen test report. That's basically just a one-time snapshot. But security is a mindset. Security is a process. Security is an attitude. And, and, and that is not something that can be contained just in the CISO office or in the security officers. The real place where that mindset needs to be is in the developers. <laughs> you know? And I think that having developers step out of their own shoes to perform that pen test for a few days really works wonders in actually doing something meaningful to improve your organizational security.
Anyway, but coming back to chat ops, the only reason why this gamification is possible is because of chat ops. You can see here, for example, that we created a scoreboard uh, application in our chat. So you can see, for example, we're having conversations right now. So you can see a point for blue for finding missing input validation. And then I used a command called good job blue. When I type in good job blue, then raw spot says incremented blue, 24 points, and it shows a motivational image. <laughs> <laughs> Geeks like that. So, you know, and that, you know, <laughs> is great, you know, and, and again, because these people can work in this chat environment, you know, that's how we make this kind of stuff possible. And I don't think we could even do this without chat ops, to be honest. But what else can you do with chat ops? So basically, any of our hacking and scanning, you know, for the most part, I would say can probably be automated and integrated into chat ops. So things like uh, Nmap scans uh, for enumerating the infrastructure, web application scanning tools like W3AF, um, uh, SQL map for uh, exploiting databases, Hydra for brute forcing passwords, etc. I mean, there's always going to be some small number of things that are hard to do via chat ops. I mean, anything where you have to point and click is a little bit hard. So, for example, Burp Suite is, you know, hard to integrate into chat ops. But a lot of tools, though, uh, you can. Reconnaissance. So, uh, who is, uh, you know, as in one example, you know, Google Queries or DuckDuckGo or let me DuckDuckGo that for you. Yes, we actually have that. So, <laughs> um, you know, our passive scanning tool uh, that we created, etc. Also, other kinds of things for exploitation, like hash cracking. Oh my God, this is the best thing in the world. We have rainbow tables. Okay, we have rainbow tables, and you can invoke them via our chat ops. So I can be sitting in a bus on my cell phone, and I can crack somebody's password using rainbow tables from my cell phone. How cool is that? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, anyway, I'm geeking out here. Um, <laughs> you know, we've also got a open source spear phishing suite, and this is also so much fun. So what we do is uh, we've got a set of chat ops tools. So what we can do is first, of course, with phishing, you have to create a pretext. So we can basically use a chat ops command to scrape a web page and then instrument that web page with links that then go uh, basically to our landing page uh, on our web server. What we then can do is put together a distribution list uh, using GitLab uh, of email addresses, and we, can we have another chat ops command then to actually send the emails to the phishing targets. Now, this is where the fun starts. So, you know, the, the, the phishing mail now has been launched. And we, again, are using these rocket chat integrations. So every time one of the targets clicks on that phishing mail, it injects in real time an announcement into the chat room, the appropriate chat room, that says this uh, re email recipient just clicked on this pretext name at this timestamp. So mind you, the security officers from that company are sitting in the channel watching their own company get fished. <laughs> you know, another thing also is one of the uh, phishing tests I think we did about a month ago, we a also had a form. So we were actually harvesting credentials at the same time. So people could fill in the form. So, you know, username, password, you know, and we fished about 150 people, about 30 people filled in that form. <laughs> you know, but at a certain point, one of the coders saw that the domain name wasn't correctly, <laughs> entirely correct. <laughs> so at that point, the developers started playing with the form. So we started seeing strange things coming in. <laughs> so for example, username, nice try assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Password, you know, something else. <laughs> username, uh, woohoo. Password, a SQL injection. <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> no, it didn't work. <laughs> but he got points for trying. You know, of course, at the end of the day, we were also asking questions like, gee, is he doing this from a sandboxed environment? <laughs> you know, but at a certain point when that was over, then, you know, the security officers were like, man, that was entertaining. Thank you. We're going for lunch now. <laughs> You know, 
but again, this is actually the really nice stuff about using chat ops. <laughs> you know, it makes all of this stuff visible, and I couldn't even think of a way to be able to offer this kind of service if you weren't using some kind of chat environment with a bot. So, all right. So we can do a lot of other kinds of things uh, related, more related to running a company generically. Uh, you know, with chat ops. So for example, project management. So like every other company in the universe, we also have project management. Uh, we use can, uh, Kanban uh, basically for this uh, and a can board uh, for, well, tracking our workflow basically. We have commands that, for example, allow us to view the can board you know, from the chat room. So we can basically be able to say, you know, I would like to know, you know, the status, for example, of this project. And then we can retrieve that information from the CAN board and display it. We can also update that information from the uh, uh, chat room. And what's even better is we've actually found ways to update project management information as a side effect of doing other things. So let me explain. We've got this thing called the ship it squirrel. Who here knows what the ship it squirrel is? Oh God, okay. You guys are missing out. So uh, <laughs> this is some more geek culture for you. So there is this thing in Slack called the ship it squirrel. So you basically go, you know, Hubot, ship it, and it gives you a picture of a squirrel. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> no, but look, I mean, it's meant as a way of celebrating the fact that you just shipped something, you know? Because we like shipping. Right? We all like shipping. <laughs> so, you know, and for you guys, it's shipping code. For us, it's shipping like a pen test report or a quotation or whatever, you know. But uh, in either case, you know, we need to celebrate the good stuff. But the really nice thing is when somebody goes raw spot, ship it, they get the squirrel. You know, we're all happy. But it also takes that item on the can board and it moves it to done. Yes. <laughs> so we're actually getting lazy, you know, pen testers to actually update project management information. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, this is the kind of stuff, again, that you can sort of do from the chat. Um, we've got another mechanism that we call Git Notes. And what this is, is uh, we actually built our own kind of support desk mechanism for uh, emails. So what it is, is uh, we, uh, for example, you know how if you use like Zendesk and those kinds of solutions, you basically get this magic email address. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, as long as you carbon copy or blind carbon copy this particular magic email address, then uh, your, uh, uh, what, how do I say, your, your support desk system then tracks the whole email threads and that kind of thing. So we basically built that system ourselves, except for the fact that uh, if uh, this, magic email address is carbon copied or blind carbon copied. First of all, it injects a copy of that into Git, uh, GitLab. But the second thing that that does is, it, again, it uses the Rocket Chat integrations. So it actually injects a message into the chat room that basically says, this sender just sent an email with this subject at this timestamp. Click here to read it. So we actually know in real time in the chat rooms when there's new you know, <laughs> information relating to a particular engagement. You know, and we basically use these triads, which basically are sort of like, you know, uh, GitLab uh, repo, uh, chat room name, and uh, can board item, you know, and basically tie these together to make sure that the appropriate things always get sent to the appropriate places. Now, the really nice thing about this is, for example, let's say we're working with a multinational or a really large customer, and we're basically doing uh, multiple projects with different business units for them. Okay. Now the security officers want to know what communications we're having with our business units. You know, they want us to keep them, you know, uh, on top of things. So what we do is we add the security officers into all of their, uh, ch their chat rooms that are related to them. We actually even can do this automatically that if we create a new, you know, chat room for this particular customer, we can automatically add, you know, the people from the, you know, the list of, uh, you know, security officers from that company. And then what happens is then when we use this magic email address, they get these, they also see these chat room announcements, you know, from, from the bot, <laughs> which basically means that they can then click on it. And with zero extra effort, we have now looped in the customer on all of our correspondence with all of their business units. And it costs us almost zero extra work. Good stuff. Another thing that we ha Im have implemented with chat ops is, for example, uh, what we call raw spot charge. So this is basically how we track billable hours. 
So like every consultancy company, we have to track billable hours. Of course, this also is the bane of our existence because you know we all hate administration. We're geeks, we do. But we've made it as painless as possible because basically what you can do is you just, in, in, in the particular chat room where you're working, you can say raw spot charge the number of hours description. And then raw spot says, thank you, name of pen tester. You just charged N hours. You have now used M hours out of the uh, allocated X hours for this particular engagement. You are now 37% of the way through this engagement with a little progress bar. This is nice because it allows us really, I mean, yes, it makes declaring hours easy, but it also gives people step by step and always a picture of how far along are we and how much time do we have left. The even better part about it is because the customers are in the chat room while this is happening, they see exactly where their money is going. <laughs> you know, because with consultancy, time is money. <laughs> it's how it is. So basically, when we put a certain number of billable hours into this, it means they can see in excruciating detail exactly where that time is going. And you know what? They love it. <laughs> so this is actually really nice. Other infra-related things, access control. So we use role-based access control, uh, primarily because we, for example, don't want uh, our customers launching scans against other people. <laughs> you know, we also don't want them being able to read, you know, the contents of our CAN board, <laughs> for example, you know, that kind of stuff. So we do have role-based access control uh, that is tied in uh, with the chat room. I have to say that the role-based access control as we have it set up then is tied in with our I mentioned holacracy earlier. So basically with how we have circles and how we have roles, basically that actually fits in really, really well with the role-based access control that we use on the infra side. Um, error logging, okay? So we all need to debug stuff. You know, one of the things about chat, chat ops that, uh, you know, can't, isn't always a good thing is it means that our chat environment is production. Okay, <laughs> in every sense of the word. If our chat environment and our chat ops environment goes offline, our entire company goes down. <laughs> you know, in that way, it's actually not probably not too dissimilar from you know Booking.com and you know some of those other companies. You know, if, if your infra goes offline, your company's probably offline too. But for us, what that means is radically open security is actually turning into a DevOps company. You know, and there's not a lot of security companies that will say that, <laughs> but it really is true because we, we can't have outages. It is disruptive to the entire company. So in that sense, you know, we have been having a massive mega refactoring in the last number of months. Uh, we've been adding unit testing to absolutely everything. You know, we have been adding continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, we've been dockerizing, you know, certain things so we can basically be able to uh, cr automatically create, you know, properly configured environments and then be able to destroy them afterwards. You know, and this also for operational security and also GDPR concerns is also really important because, you know, we shouldn't have old data hanging around for a really long time. Just there's many different ways in which that's bad. But back to debugging. So we have chat rooms that do absolutely nothing else except display error logs. And this is really great because then the developers in my infra team can see all of the error logging for the code that they're writing without needing shell on the server. You know, for security, that is just awesome. So, you know, we've got an error log channel, we've got debug log channels. You can basically create as many channels as you want for the different kinds of uh, logging. You don't add everybody to those channels. They're only interesting to a certain subset of people, but this is great. We also created a help menu system that uh, resembles man pages. Um, you know, just because, uh, well, you know, when you start having so many chat ops commands, you need some way of being able to keep them organized. And so people know what the syntax are, are of all of them, et cetera. So we basically created kind of an interactive man pages kind of style thing, you know, that we uh, uh, use to keep the chat ops commands organized. You know, and the future, as I see it, are things like AI chatbots, you know? Um, I think uh, the, the first workshop on day one, uh, you know, was uh, one of the workshops was talking about uh, how to make uh, interactive, uh, intelligent uh, chatbots with natural language processing. I just want to say that I think that the potential for this kind of thing is enormous, you know. 
since you guys are data scientists, just let me say really quickly, if you guys know anybody who is interested in working on this particular thing, and or if you know any master students looking for a thesis project, <laughs> you know, we're, I think we would actually be a really great applied place uh, to do such a thing because we have a super need for it. You know, and I think we could use these AI chatbots for things like answering frequently asked questions. We could use it for onboarding people. We could use it for customer satisfaction surveys. <laughs> we could use it for staff satisfaction surveys. And the really nice thing about the chat ops is, you know, especially with surveys, let's face it, surveys are annoying. You know, I get surveys all the time in the email, and you know what I do? I throw them away. <laughs> I, I ignore them because they're annoying. You know, but if you do a survey in the chat, you can use the chat bot to enforce the dis discipline of doing the asking, because, of course, you know, uh, oftentimes we forget. But if the customer gives a question or an answer that you weren't expecting, there's humans in the room, which means then that the human can actually take over the conversation, you know, which then again gives it the personal touch, <laughs> you know, which uh, makes sure that it actually isn't annoying. So I think there's so much that we can do with chatbots, also in terms of hacking. So anyway, if anybody is interested, talk to me, please. So, okay, a lot about us, I think, is very weird, but weird is actually sort of almost kind of the same thing as really innovative. So, uh, <laughs> you know, we have won a lot of awards, you know, both for our business model as well as for the way that we work. So we, for example, the Dutch Chamber of Commerce called Radically Open Security the 50th most innovative SME in the Netherlands, uh, you know, in, in 2016. I'm super proud of that. <laughs> Another thing also, we have won, you know, uh, innovation awards for uh, some of our not-for-profit projects that we've done. I've had no time today to talk about them, but we do a number of non-profit projects because, again, we're a non-profit company, so we can afford to be able to do this for cost price for NGOs and civil society groups. So we had this NetAid kit, uh, which is a Wi-Fi, completely open source Wi-Fi tour and open VPN router for 25 euros that we built together with Free Press Unlimited. Uh, over on the Vbatstraat, and uh, we won basically uh, the Internet Freedom Festival Tool Showcase Award for that, also the ISAC uh, NL Inter Internet Innovation Award. Uh, we've won awards for research. One of our hackers won a, an award at Black Hat uh, for most innovative research, the Pony Award, uh, which is no small deal if you guys know anything about security conferences. Um, you know, we won entrepreneurship awards, things like the Sprout Challenger 50, you know, and, w I, well, most recently, um, CIO Magazine actually called me the most innovative IT leader in the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> for 2017. So, but look, I don't think it's about me. It's more about what we're trying to do. Number one, the nonprofit company. Stop and think about how you guys could create nonprofit companies in your own area. So my new side project that I'm currently starting is something called Nonprofit Ventures. So what it is, we're actually building a nonprofit incubator to help create more nonprofit companies. Okay, so this is up and coming. Uh, I think it's a new kind of social enterprise uh, that uh, I think we can apply. Think about it this way, business as a tool for positive impact, business as a tool for activism, business as an creative art form, business as a form of self-expression. You know, people don't think about business this way, but I think that we should. Because if enough people created not-for-profit social enterprises, I think that the world would be a lot better place <laughs> than it currently is. So I think that's one thing. The other thing, of course, that's innovative about us is the openness and transparency. So please try and think about how you can take some of these principles and integrate them into your own organizations. There's a lot of good ideas, and also all of our software is open source and free, freely available for anyone. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, so thank you.